Hey, Crystal. Hey, Joseph. Do you want to talk about a wacky week in the Bible? Easter week? That's one of the wackiest. Listen in to find out more. Welcome to A Word from Our Outpost. With Joseph and Crystal Gruber. A podcast for Catholic disciples who are wrestling to be missionary-minded in their normal, everyday lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Direct, O Lord, our actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, that every word and work of ours may begin in thee, and by thee be happily ended. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Easter week, you think it's wacky? Yeah, I I, I do. I didn't used to until uh, homily on Sunday that we heard. Yeah, just in passing, uh, the priest made the the observation that the apostles from Easter Sunday through what is now known as Divine Mercy Sunday, it had other names in other calendars, but the the week after Easter, um, that Thomas the Apostle didn't see the resurrected Lord until the second Sunday, and nobody could convince him that he was raised. For a whole week. A whole week. Yeah, and Were they only trying to convince Thomas and nobody else? It seems like that was the stopgap right there. It seems like convincing him was not an effective thing. So just as a sweeping kind of comment about the week and a half from, you know, Good Friday through Divine Mercy Sunday, it's the, um, it's the week where we as Catholics liturgically start to have the most in common with the atheists and the agnostics, you know, the, the atheists, the, the Nietzscheans who say God is dead and we killed him. It's like, yes, for, for like a day and a half, two days, that's, uh, we're, we're right there with you. But then from Easter Sunday morning through Divine Mercy Sunday or through Pentecost, uh, depending on how you want to count it, there's this idea of like, well, if if I didn't see it, why would I believe it? I'm going to I'm going to stay in this state of not knowing. And and to 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 sit with that, to commiserate with Thomas in that just as you commiserate with all of the apostles on Good Friday evening and and Holy Saturday morning, just this like, oh. Yeah, life is really bad without this Jesus guy. Or life is really confusing if I don't know if he's risen or not. And and be like, oh, that's that's actually uh, a a good, not just thought exercise, right? It, it, it's it's <coughs> I don't know what liturgical living really is. I know there are a lot of podcasts about it and books about it. I don't really know what it means to be living liturgically, but I have this idea that we're supposed to be entering into the reality of that moment. And that moment is like a really awkward moment. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is an awkward moment. And, and it's interesting because I think, you know, for talking about it in light of liturgical living, there's a lot of feasts where I could see at least theoretically where it's, easier to get pulled into that moment if you have a certain foods or certain decorations or different things like this. But, but there's a, the Triduum and Easter week, there's like, it's like a feeling (laughs) that can't be forced. And so what does it look like to enter into this? And in particular, you know, when I usually have thought about Easter week, I've thought about like Christ is risen and this is really exciting and let's be excited and eat all the candy and be excited. <laughs> but to realize for the apostles that that wasn't a, an exciting week. They were I mean it was exciting in a different way. They, I don't think they had candy. No, but they were hiding. Uh-huh. They were hiding. They were hiding. They weren't like shouting from the rooftops and rejoicing Christ is risen for that first week. No. And, and this is this is a weird thing. So I, I taught apologetics to the focus missionaries twice. Was it twice? Maybe. I think I did. Yeah. At least once, possibly twice. And the the apologetics lesson about the divinity of Christ was a difficult one to really teach 
because basically I was telling them here we have eyewitness testimony and we have the agreement with the Old Testament scriptures. I don't know if that's actually going to convince anyone though, because that's literally what the 10 apostles in the upper room and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus brought to the table before Thomas. They had a week to say, we are eyewitnesses, there's an empty tomb, and we have the agreement of the whole Old Testament that this was going to go down the way it went down. And Thomas still said, nope, unless I stick my finger in his uh, hands and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And to say, like, oh, there, there is the limit. Like, He's not saying that they're crazy. He's not disowning them. He's not saying... Therefore, I, I will not break bread with you. He's not saying, I, I think you're tricking me. He's just saying, I, I'm going to stay in this state of not believing. And, and your arguments, which are literally the arguments that I taught on the days that I've taught apologetics about the divinity of Christ. It's like the agreement of the Old Testament with the events and the passion, the eyewitness accounts, like why would they lie, the fact that there's an empty tomb, but it doesn't move Thomas. That is not enough to make for belief. And that's a weird thing. It's it's the limitations of apologetics, if, if nothing else. Well, and it's interesting, I think, from two sides, because I could think of it, you know, on the one side, from the perspective of the other apostles who did see the risen Lord, and, and how frustrated they might be, but on the same note, like, they're hiding. Like, they know that this is a a hard truth to swallow and they're not exactly running around shouting it from the rooftops yet. Um, so, so they ha- also have some sort of hesitation internally, but then also from Thomas's perspective, thinking about times in my life where I'm like, man, Lord, I'm not so sure that this is worth me putting my neck out on the line for like, is this the real deal? And were you the real deal or do I really trust you without something more tangible and and that desire i mean we see this a lot as as we've been working through creating this dating course and people want certainty that the person i'm dating is the right person for me to marry and we we just you don't get that (laughs) that's not oh that's a that's an interesting analogy right there yeah and and it's like this grasping for for certainty there's there's something really human in what thomas wants right this like the we want we want to know something is real we want to be able to put our hands on it and yet we don't always get to do that and we still have to take a leap of faith anyways yeah it's 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 not like thomas is rebuked for the the lack of immediate belief based on the testimony of the other apostles in, in fact jesus invites him to confirm he says, "Blessed are those who who are who don't see, who won't see, and and and, and will believe." Uh, but he doesn't say that like, you aren't blessed, Thomas. He's not saying, "Well, you're not going to be an apostle, and you're not going to, you know, preach the gospel in India and start, you know, the Christian church there that will endure for at least two thousand years and going right. Like they're still going." Um, he he didn't say that. He just said, you know. The people who will believe, based on these things, uh, they're going to be blessed. But he does—he doesn't say, you know, like with Zechariah, who says, "How can this be that uh, that my wife and I can have a child in our old age?" And he gets struck dumb for approximately a year. That's not what happens. He—he's he, given the opportunity to find out. So that's a really weird thing, because for the most part, Christ doesn't appear to Christians and say, stick your finger in my hand and your hand in my side. And so we're left with this weird, like, well, Thomas got it. Why not me? Is the eyewitness testimony of Thomas not enough for you either? I mean, was it... Was it <laughs> I mean, you, you increased from, you know... <clears throat> A dozen eyewitnesses, or a little over a dozen, Baker's dozen, to, one more. to 14. I'm not, I'm not. No. Yeah. And I, I think that that's a, 
it's a hard question, but I also, it's helpful for me to know that I'm not alone in when I don't have like an immediate positive response or when I want more from the Lord that like that that's part of my human nature. It, maybe it's part of my fallen nature, but here we are. Fallen. I mean, wanting to know things through the senses is that's how knowledge starts. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that has just been a helpful meditation for me of, Oh yeah. The apostles, the Easter week for them was not Skittles and Reese's peanut butter cups. And Thomas needed more. And they, so he didn't reject them and they didn't reject him Mm. for not believing. Yeah. And I think there's this weird thing, like when, when we come across people who are experiencing doubt or people who are saying, I don't know what I believe. um, And we say, well, I don't know what to do with you. They, They still, I mean, maybe a little bit out of necessity because out of association with this, you know, uh, convicted uh, blasphemer and traitor and uh, man who had been condemned to death and hung upon a tree and died. They, they don't want to be out in public. So there's sort of like this guilt by association thing that's being processed for them. Um, but they don't cast him out and he doesn't cast them out. Like they're, they're, they get it. They they didn't immediately believe Mary Magdalene. They get not believing. And I think for a lot of Catholics and a lot of Christians, they don't always seem to understand this scenario. And I'm like, this is one of the most easy to understand scenarios out there. I I totally get why somebody would hear about somebody who was condemned to death in uh, Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and then there are stories of him coming back to life I get why they would say I don't know what to think about that or I, I really something else has to happen for me to take that seriously I I get that yeah well and I think the other thing that is interesting for me in terms of an examination of conscience I think when I find myself tempted to not want to interact with somebody who is struggling with that. It's because, <clears throat> quite frankly, I'm afraid that they're going to draw out the doubt that exists in me, and I'm afraid to deal with that, and so I just would rather ignore it altogether. And and to be able to look at the apostles in this week and say, wait a second, like, I know their whole story. They were all martyred for the faith except one, and definitely had were able to eventually be really bold for Jesus. So maybe just maybe entering into these questions and this doubt is part of the process of being able to have the kind of boldness and not something to be afraid of. Yeah. I, I, and I think just being uh, understanding of why some of these things could be more difficult for some or more difficult for myself at different points in my life. And to say like, oh, like 10 out of the 11 were convinced, uh, but a little over 10% of the apostles at the time were not convinced. And being like, okay, the moral sense of this, like... um. I can, I can, I can understand. I can, I, I mean, I, I've mentioned before that I have like an inner atheist an inner, well, an inner Jewish man, an inner atheist, an inner agnostic. I think that's all I have inside. Like <laughs> poking and prodding the things that I say about the faith and being like, does this hold water? You know, how does this actually accord with the fullness of revelation? How does this accord with reason? Does this, would this make sense to an atheist or to agnostic uh, listeners? Um, and to be okay with that. Be like, I can keep company with people who don't believe. Um, 
the, the apostles literally did that for that week. Yeah. So maybe as a sort of take home point for this podcast, dear listener, is are there are there places where you've got a little bit of a doubting Thomas in you that you're afraid to spend time with? Can you spend time in that space trusting in the Lord's goodness and providence and desire to reveal himself more fully to you? And it invite the Holy Spirit to be active, right? Mm. Like what what made the difference between Easter Sunday and Divine Mercy Sunday and the 40 days where Christ is popping in and out of people's lives? Well, nine days after that is Pentecost and and that's the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he does convict hearts. He he does uh catalyze conversion. He does convict people of sin. And to to ask him, like, what can you be more active in my life? Like if if Christ isn't going to appear bodily and have uh an, an invitation for me to put my finger in his hand and hand in his side, maybe just maybe the Holy Spirit will move in me. I agree with all that has been said, bringing the Holy Spirit into that meditation, into that space of, am I struggling with doubt? What is going on here? Am I willing to be convicted, um, convinced? I don't know. Different people use the word convicted. And I'm like, I don't feel like that's a weird Christian-y <laughs> idiom. That sounds like it could be a whole other podcast on its own. Yeah, but but the the... The biggest thing is the the coming of the Holy Spirit either does something or doesn't do something, mm-hmm. right? But that's pretty clear. It transformed the ancient world. Like the, the Catholic Church transformed the ancient world. And yet here we are still in this space between the resurrection and Pentecost. And and as I ponder, what does it mean to live that out liturgically in the past? I have not thought about the like fear and trembling <laughs> that the apostles spent time in. Yeah, and and the other utter impossibility of evangelization without the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. Like Pope Paul the Sixth and Evangelii Nunciandi, he said that the Holy Spirit is the primary agent of evangelization. Is that how he phrased it? That sounds right. Right. And uh, that that doesn't just mean, oh, he's like the first among many. It, it means like if he's not active, evangelization isn't active. Yeah. So that's like you could have walked with Jesus for three years. You could have had a mystic vision of our Lord. He could have breathed upon you. He could have sat down and had a meal with you. Um, and in the breaking of the bread, he could have disappeared. He could have poured out how his life was uh, uh, foretold in Scripture from the, the beginning of the books of Moses all the way through the prophets. But if the Holy Spirit isn't active, then no one's going to listen. Even the people who you would think would be the most disposed to listen— with the best arguments that you could possibly have, it still won't do anything. And that's, you know, and and that's kind of okay to be like, okay. And even if the Holy Spirit is active, that doesn't mean people are going to respond. Yeah. Like, we, we are not we consequentialists. We, we don't think that something was good and worthwhile just because it worked. Um. People have free will. They do. Weird. Yes. All right. Were there? Was there any? I feel like we almost wrapped up. I brought in the Holy Spirit, and then I don't know if you had a call to action. Yeah, I think just to spend some time pondering. Do are you okay with spending some time being doubting Thomas? And are you okay with inviting the Lord into that space? And seeing what he has to say about it. Are you okay with being limited in your ability to communicate truth? Like, people don't have to listen to us. It's tough. 
we're at the end of the podcast. Nobody forced you to keep listening, dear listener. <laughs> and here you are. And now I'm going to pray us out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, teach us to pray, teach us to be attentive to to your movements, that we might do the will of the Father. And we ask all this in the holy name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the, of the Father, Father, and of the Son, and of the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit. amen. amen. From our outpost to yours, thanks for listening. And a special thanks to John Mark Skoke. That's S-K-O-C-H. For the music. Check him out on Spotify. 